Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, uh, again, thanks uh, so much for inviting me. And uh, for this talk, I wanted to tell you all a little bit about some of the computational techniques I've worked on for molecular reconstruction. And um, in particular, I'm going to focus on reconstruction from small data sets of imagine maybe uh, several hundred to a thousand or so picked particles. Now, many of my collaborators uh, from the Flatiron Institute are listed here, and I'll give a shout out to them at the end uh, as well. Now, just to recap, uh, here's a picture many of you have seen before in other talks and other presentations, illustrating the scenario that we're interested in. And on the left, we have a cartoon of an ice sheet within which are many proteins, multiple proteins at different orientations. And an electron microscope can image these proteins, producing a micrograph shown in the center, uh, from which individual particle images can be picked. Now, if we have sufficiently many picked particle images, then their viewing angles can be estimated and the volume corresponding to the protein can be reconstructed. Now, uh, there we go. Now, obviously the cartoon in the previous slide was a bit idealistic. And in practice, the images, here's an example shown here, are a lot noisier and we can't perform the reconstruction from just nine of them. So on the left here, I show uh, four images each are a projection of the trip V1 molecule, denoted by capital F here on the right. Now, these images are more representative of the kinds of image noise that would be present in experiment. And in order to reconstruct a volume as nice as this one over here, we're going to need maybe tens to hundreds of thousands or more picked particle images like this. Now, obtaining these images isn't always easy, and uh, it can take some amount of micros microscope time and some amount of manpower to obtain, say, several dozen micrographs and a few thousand picked particle images like this. Now, the reconstruction process itself, going from these images to this volume, would be relatively trivial if we knew the orientations, the viewing angles of each of the images. Then the reconstruction process would be just uh, simple linear algebra. The tricky part of the problem, the main problem, is that uh, as you know, we, we don't know the viewing angles associated with each of the images, and we have to estimate those as well. So just to give uh, a better sense for the task at hand, here are a few other images of the same molecule on top. And the presumption is that each of these images denoted A1, A2, A3, etc. although these are actually taken from a stack on Empire, so these are the official image numbers. Each of these images should be a projection of the volume F, that trip V1 molecule that I showed earlier, from some viewing angle polluted with noise. Now, in this case, because we know F, we can compare every image to every projection of F, which we'll call the template associated with that orientation of the molecule F. And we can see which template fits each image the best. And shown below each image is the template that uh, defined by a viewing angle tau that we believe you know constitutes the signal within the image above it. And if you squint, you can kind of see, oh yeah, right, maybe there's some blobs here that correspond to these lumps here. Maybe there's some shape here that corresponds to this and so forth. So within this context, I want to focus, there we go. I want to focus on the step where the picked particle images are converted ab initio into a low resolution molecule. And this step is a precursor to the high resolution refinement procedures, which maybe through multiple iterations, produce that detailed volume that I showed earlier. And uh, the goal that I wanna focus on, my, my hope is a goal, the, the goal, sorry, my hope is that I'll kind of lead towards an algorithm that can operate on relatively few picked particle images, like I said, a few thousand. And I want something that can work quickly, robustly, automatically, so that after a short amount of microscope time, the images can be processed to give some idea of what the volume might look like. And this can be useful for a variety of reasons, like uh, you can do online quality control, you can sort new images, you can detect bad images. And maybe if after 
running a reliable enough algorithm, you only get garbage out. Maybe you add garbage in to begin with, and maybe you want to rerun the the experiment if molecules aren't well isolated or the picked particle images don't look particularly useful when it comes to reconstruction. So the strategy that uh, I'll talk about is very similar to the standard strategy of alternating minimization, maybe referred to as AM, with two additions. First, I'll describe a slight twist um, called uh, entropy maximization or maximum entropy alignment, which stabilizes the iteration, stabilizes the calculation of alternating minimization across multiple iterations. And then if I have time at the end, I'll briefly describe what I mean by this PM, what is the principal mode projection, and uh, how that could be used to denoise the data and compress the relevant information. Now, as I have written down here, um, there are a lot of other strategies for ab initio reconstruction out there. People use Bayesian inference, which I'll bring up again later, and there's a variety of different open source software packages out there. I, I just want to emphasize that because the problem is non-convex, reconstructing the volume while at the same time getting some sense for what the viewing angles of the images are, we don't actually expect any one strategy to always be the best strategy in every scenario. Instead, depending on the molecule you're dealing with, how many images you have, how noisy, and so forth, certain strategies are going to have advantages and disadvantages in different regimes. So ultimately, what I hope for is that the techniques that I describe will be easy to adopt and roll into other strategies that you might already be comfortable with for ab initio reconstruction. So to set the stage, uh, let me just first remind you of the standard strategy of alternating minimization. And the way this works is starting with experimental images, as well as say random viewing angles assigned to each image, one can alternate between first using the estimated viewing angles to reconstruct an approximate volume. And that involves maybe a least square solve, something from linear algebra. And then once you have the estimated volume, you can align the images to that volume to better estimate the viewing angles. Maybe this would involve a variety of uh, similarity calculations, measuring something like inner products. And once you align the images to the volume, hopefully you get better angles, and then you can repeat this process. And in an ideal scenario, you iterate this process multiple times, and each iteration improves the volume and the viewing angle estimates. Now, I just want to mention before I go on that for standard alternating minimization, the alignment step where you uh, align the images to the volume associates each image with the viewing angle that it best corresponds to given the current volume estimate. And this is referred to as a maximum likelihood alignment in contrast to the maximum entropy alignments I'll mention in a moment. So, does alternating minimization actually work? Well, usually it doesn't, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't have much to report. And what we actually see in practice when trying to use alternating minimization is that it, it fails. And, and I'll try and describe why. I'll show, give you some examples or illustrations of why it fails in a moment. But in the very best case scenario, what happens, if we're very lucky, is that Alternating minimization proceeds in two phases. First, there's a global search phase where every iteration is quite a bit different from the last and the viewing angles jump around a lot. And if we're lucky, then what happens is that the kind of tumultuous, turbulent, you know, jumping back and forth in the this global search phase, chances upon something that actually resembles the actual molecule. And then the viewing angles lock into accurate values, and then alternating minimization starts to converge, entering a kind of a local phase where the viewing angles don't change much every iteration and the volume converges to something. So if you actually apply alternating minimization, you get something like this. So let me uh, walk you through this, this case study here. 
this is a illustration of what happens if you apply alternating minimization to the the trip one molecule that I showed earlier in specific to the to the first thousand you know picked particle images if you imagine having only a small data set associated with that trip B1 molecule and you were to try and reconstruct it ab initio using alternating minimization you might start with randomized angles and proceed as I described in the previous slide and each line here is one trial doing that kind of thing starting with a different random set of initial viewing angles and um, the the correlation between the estimated volume and the true published volume is plotted on the vertical axis and the iteration number is plotted on the horizontal axis and as i mentioned each line corresponds to a different random trial now what i didn't tell you is that actually during the first 16 iterations of this process i didn't run alternating minimization what i did during the first 16 iterations of this process is I specifically constrained the viewing angles in the uh, in this alignment step here. I specifically constrained the viewing angles to be uniformly distributed on the sphere. In other words, I deliberately constrained the distribution of viewing angles to be uh, a distribution that has maximum entropy. And when you look at what's happening during this initial set of iterations when I'm imposing this maximum entropy constraint, you can see that the quality of the recovered volume measured on the vertical doesn't improve too quickly. Nothing too dramatic happens and the correlation slowly improves. Now at iteration 16, I turn off that constraint and I actually employ or I actually uh, implement standard alternating minimization. That is, I use uh, maximum likelihood alignment, assigning every image to the viewing angle that best matches it. And you can see that while initially promising, very quickly, standard alternating minimization with maximum likelihood alignment goes awry. And in each case, the trials produce some wild volume that's very, very far from the truth. And in terms of the iterations themselves, what we typically see is that this standard alternating minimization leads to the viewing angles clumping together in some unphysical way. You know, for example, on a great circle on the sphere or maybe in antipodal cl like clumps, one pole and the other. So in this slide, I show the same numerical experiment. This corner here is the same as, uh, as this guy. So I show the same numerical experiment um, applied not only to the trip V1 molecule on the bottom, but to two other molecules as well on the middle and the top. This is the ribosome, and this is a, a different molecule that I'll show you later. Now, you don't, uh, we'll, we'll maybe discuss the different columns in a moment. You can ignore them for now. They correspond to retaining different amounts of angular information. So using a different number of radial principal modes, which I'll return to later. But what I want you to mainly note is that, uh, well, you can, I guess for now, focus on this side where you're using essentially all the available information um, for these different three molecules. And you can see that uh, while alternating minimization occasionally, like this one trial, happens to chance upon a good configuration and might converge, the typical result is definitely not great across these molecules. Now, this numerical experiment, I think, motivates a, a slight alteration in the general strategy. Because you can see, kind of uniformly during the first 16 iterations, constraining the viewing angle distribution prevents the viewing angles from clumping, but it also prevents the volume from converging to the true volume very quickly. On the other hand, standard alternating minimization often points in a good direction initially, resulting in some initial improvements when the viewing angle distribution was initially uniform. But if you let alternating minimization take too many iterations in a row, then the viewing angles clump and things diverge. So a 
sort of a how do you say like a absolutely basic strategy that one might suggest after this is um here we go what if we simply alternate between uh first doing some kind of standard maximum likelihood alignment and two doing a maximum entropy alignment where the viewing angle distribution is constrained can we get the best of both worlds maybe and you can see that yeah the results are substantially more robust of course if you don't have any information then maybe you're not going to converge to something good but if you keep a reasonable amount of angular information then this EMPM algorithm is uh substantially more robust it gives pretty reliable results so as a side note i do have some insight into why this heuristic works i don't have a guarantee that it's going to work well there are always going to be you know um pathological situations or maybe even not so pathological situations where it doesn't but uh but it does perform well in practice across all the synthetic data and actual molecules i tried so to recapitulate um I, I can get back at the end if i have a little time i can show you some maybe some uh simpler case studies where where the the behavior of this particular heuristic can be analyzed anyway um just to recapitulate here's the the sort of full flowchart illustrating this EMPM strategy. And uh, one aspect that I only briefly mentioned before is that I compress the information in the images before processing them. And uh, I can talk more about this later. Uh, I mentioned that there uh, are some radial principal modes involved, but one technical detail is that the compression itself can be improved once you have a reasonable estimate of the volume. So the full strategy of this entropy maximization with principal modes, this EMPM algorithm, involves uh, first one, uh, estimating the appropriate compression using the images alone. And that produces what are called empirical principal modes. And then you compress the images and run this alternating minimization, uh, this alternate alternating alignment strategy, where oh wait, where did it go? The alternating alignment strategy is where you reconstruct using the images and angles to form a volume, and then you take one step of maximum likelihood alignment. This is typical alternating minimization. Then you reconstruct again, and then you take a step of maximum entropy alignment. And if you keep alternating between maximum likelihood and maximum entropy alignment, then you get this this sort of slow climb, slow, steady climb that I showed here. And you don't suffer from this catastrophic, aphysical, you know, um, divergence that you see here. Okay. Now, after you do this for a little bit, what happens is uh, you get a pretty decent volume, but then just to polish things up, what you can do is you can use the volume you get to re-estimate the principal modes. This is kind of like a cleaned up way of compressing the 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 data slightly slightly more efficiently. And then you can do a few more iterations at the end and repeat the process once again. And after you do that, basically things have converged. And if you re-estimate the volume, nothing changes. Now, at this point, you're probably asking, okay, what what do other people do? And um, many common strategies, including the uh, Relyon de novo solver in Relyon, uh, involve a form of Bayesian inference, which is loosely illustrated here. And Bayesian inference typically involves an iteration that takes as an input some initial volume, as well as the experimental images, of course, and an estimate, this is an important thing that I may not have enough time to dwell on, but I, I can maybe talk about it later, an estimate of the noise level within the experimental images. So this noise estimate functions something, functions similarly to like a temperature uh, with respect to the internal likelihood calculation. Now, given the volume, what Bayesian inference does is it estimates the log likelihood that every image was generated by that volume at each viewing angle. And this log likelihood 
then scales with the internal temperature. So Bayesian inference uses the normalized likelihoods to weight each image's contribution at each viewing angle when reconstructing a new volume for the next iteration. And if you were to run Bayesian inference with a smaller temperature, the relative impact of the highest likelihoods versus those of the lowest would increase. So as the temperature gets smaller, or if you take the limit as the temperature goes to zero, the most likely peaks end up dominating the likelihood landscape. So more simply, as the temperature goes to zero, uh, what do I say this? Uh, um, as the temperature uh, goes to zero, Bayesian inference actually converges to alternating minimization with maximum likelihood alignment, the, the strategy that typically doesn't work that I showed you before. And the converse is also true, which is that as the temperature increases, the likelihood landscape for Bayesian inference gets flatter and flatter, and all the viewing angles appear equally likely. And so for sufficiently large temperatures, Bayesian inference just produces a spherically symmetric distribution. So why am I going through all of this? The point that I'm trying to, to focus on here is just that Bayesian inference produces a volume which is sensitive to the choice of internal temperature, the noise estimate that you use. And if you have a good noise estimate that's close to the true noise estimate, then Bayesian inference will produce something reasonable or can produce something reasonable. But if you don't have a good noise estimate, if it's too big or too small, then it's not clear what Bayesian inference is gonna do. And so this sensitivity to the choice of temperature can make Bayesian inference difficult to automate. So um, let me now just show you a handful of examples illustrating the kinds of low resolution ab initio reconstructions one might generate. So on the far left of each of these strips, I show the, the, um, the low resolution version of the published molecule, which I'm gonna take as a ground truth. And from this ground truth, we can estimate the viewing angles of say a thousand images randomly grabbed from the, from the data stack, from the empire stack, and then perform a reconstruction. So I call that this Oracle, right? It's the reconstruct, it's, in some sense, you can think about it as the best reconstruction you could hope for using uh, ground truth informed or Oracle informed viewing angles for the images. And we can then run alternating minimization starting with the Oracle, which we can think of as a rough ceiling. And that's, uh, that's this. Or we could run Bayesian inference starting with the Oracle again, as well as a foreknowledge of the optimal internal temperature. So these these sort of Oracle-informed Bayesian inference results are what you get, not if you just run Bayesian inference with an arbitrary, uh oh hold on, uh, not if you just run Bayesian inference with an arbitrary noise estimate, but with the best possible noise estimate, you know, after scanning across all the noise estimates. And um, finally, on the far right, I show the reconstruction from, uh, from a trial of this EMPM algorithm with 32 iterations or that, that I showed you before. And so it's certainly far from perfect, right? This EMPM low resolution reconstruction doesn't look like the ground truth, but it's not unreasonable. And, um, you know, here's a variety of different, different scenarios. For some of these data sets, things are pretty noisy, so you don't do a great job. But even when you don't do an awesome job, you still do pretty close to what you might expect from an Oracle informed uh, starting position. And oh, and in each of these cases, the EMPM algorithm is run with some random initial initialization. So um, okay, so what do I want to uh, just mention really quickly? So even though this EMPM strategy imposes this entropy maximization across the distribution of viewing angles every alternate iteration, the actual distribution of viewing angles, in the um, in the data set could be far from uniform. So let's just take a look here. Example, for example, at uh, trip B one, the actual true distribution of viewing angles from the data set that I pulled, the thousand images, is far from uniform. This is a histogram of the true uh, distribution of viewing angles 
where you're I'm I'm projecting onto only the polar polar viewing angle, and you get this distribution. There's um, many images from the poles and many images from the equator, but few in between. After running the EMPM algorithm and getting this, you know, plausible but not great reconstruction we can then estimate the viewing angle distribution and get something that's not too dissimilar from the true viewing angle distribution. Let B1 is a molecule over here, here it is, that's even more extreme. This molecule is long and thin, it looks like a pencil. And so it usually lies on its side. So the viewing angle distribution is almost entirely equatorial, the true viewing angle distribution. And when you run EMPM, you get something that's not too terrible. It's, it's not great, but it's not wildly inaccurate. And the estimated viewing angle distribution is, again, concentrated around the equator. So I just am saying this to, um, to emphasize that even though uh, the EMPM algorithm enforces this you know, uniform viewing angle, maximum entropy distribution of viewing angles every alternating iteration, it still can converge to something that's reasonable that allows you to back out the true distribution of the viewing angles, or at least something not too dissimilar from it. Okay. Now, I just showed you a, um, a result from a single trial earlier, and that's not the whole story, of course. Uh, you can't tell much from just a single ISO surface. So here are the results from multiple trials. So the trials from EMPN are shown in uh, magenta here with the various trials sorted in terms of ascending quality. So correlation with the ground truth. And I've also shown the Oracle in black. This is kind of the best possible quality you can get given the thousand images that I picked. And uh, this can be thought of as like a ceiling for alternating minimization. The best possible result you can get from Bayesian inference is shown in teal here. This is Bayesian inference starting with the optimal noise estimate and all the, you know, the, the ground truth volume. And I've also shown some, uh, oh, what is this uh, blue thing? So OBIT is the best possible Oracle informed result using Bayesian inference. These blue curves, these blue reconstructions are what you get if you run standard Bayesian inference with the best possible Oracle informed noise level. So not an arbitrary noise level and not a noise level estimated from the images themselves, but a noise level that's kind of um, uh, the, uh, the same one used for this Oracle informed Bayesian inference. Uh, the blue is a result that you would get from using rely on de novo. Uh, the green, this olive green, the dark green is from Aspire's uh, common lines code. And the uh, kind of brick red over here is from Cryo Dragon's ab initio reconstruction. And you can see that the results from EMPM are kind of, well, um, they, they, they seem to be relatively robust and often give you something that's not too dissimilar from from what you could expect from Oracle informed Bayes uh, Bayesian inference run with the best possible noise level. And it's also a lot faster, which I'll mention in a second, which is that um, I ran all these on my own workstation and I don't have access to a GPU. So um, based on these implementations, uh, each run of EMPM took about an hour. Uh, CryoDragon took about five hours. Um, Aspire was quite fast, but uh, um, had a hard time getting high quality reconstructions in many of these cases. Uh, that was only 15 minutes. Rely on de novo took about 24 hours. Bayesian inference took about each run of Bayesian inference took around 30 hours. And uh, and so I think that the my hope is that this EMPM algorithm is very simple. It's easy to run. It doesn't have a high computational cost, and um, and it gives pretty reliable, robust results. Okay, so for uh, for further inspection here, um, I can just uh, 
show you uh, a, just a collection of ISO surfaces corresponding to some of the runs that I showed earlier. Uh, here's the Oracle over on the far left, the MPM, something produced by Reliant De Novo's results and so forth. And you can see that, um, yeah, I, you know, um, the, the different strategies uh, all have scenarios where they work and maybe scenarios where they don't work so well. And that's not, that's not necessarily a problem, right? Uh, as I mentioned, that each of these methods has uh, its own strengths. It's designed with a particular regime in mind. And the regime that I'm considering is one with relatively few images and uh, little to no prior information. So the other methods that I just compared EMPM to, let me go back and show you here. So wait, so these, these other methods are we're not designed with this regime in mind, whereas EMPM is designed with this regime in mind. And uh, so my goal here, just to be clear, is I, I don't want to replace any other pipeline. I just want to showcase these simple techniques, which should be pretty easy to adopt and integrate into any pipeline that you run. So here's an analogy. This is a picture of uh, Dick Fosbury at the 1968 Olympics. Now, previously, the most common strategy for high, the high jump was to run up, jump, and try and straddle the bar, rolling over the top of the bar face down. Dick Fosbury noticed that by taking a slightly different approach, he could get better results. And Dick Fosbury introduced this Fosbury flop shown here to the world by winning the gold at the 1968 Olympics, but he didn't win the gold the next time because by then uh, other high jumpers had wised up and they had adopted and perfected this technique. So anyway, um, with this analogy in mind, the next time you do an ab initio reconstruction, whatever software program you run, whatever you know code you use, maybe you can try spreading the viewing angles around a little bit every once in a while, every few iterations you might avoid the catastrophic divergence of standard alternating minimization, and you might substantially improve the robustness of your results. Okay, so let me just, uh, I'm just gonna quickly see how much time we have left, uh, about 10 minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to finish up in, an, uh, in a 10 minutes here. Um, what are we doing? Present a slideshow. Okay, so what can you do with uh, with a better ab initio reconstruction. It's probably not that much of a surprise that a better ab initio volume can help you produce a better high res volume. So here's an example where I ran rely on, uh, rely on refine on the first 8,000 images from the trip V1 data set that I showed earlier. And I ran the refinement twice. The first time I started with the slightly lower quality rely on de novo reconstruction obtained using the first thousand images. And then I got um, one uh, result, and the FSC curve for that result is shown in blue. And the second time I ran rely on refine using the better de no low resolution de novo reconstruction produced by the EMPM algorithm, and I got a better FSC for the refined volume. Okay, that's not that surprising. Um, a better ab initio reconstruction also allows for a more accurate estimate of image quality by correlating each image with the associate template from the reconstruction, you can estimate which good images are good and which images are bad. But I don't wanna to spend too much time on this slide since I only have 10 minutes. And um, instead, let me jump to, uh, yeah, let me jump to, to this, um, which is a way to use uh, low resolution, once you use a low resolution reconstruction to estimate image quality, you can use that estimate of image quality to help you with image curation. So here's an example using the pre-catalytic spliceosome. I looked at the first 8,000 images from the image stack, and I divided all those images into random batches of 1,000, and I produced multiple reconstructions, all shown here in magenta. And the average correlation for each of the reconstructions was about uh, 0.67. That's this pink bar here. I then 
used the individual estimates of image quality. So imagine that you know you get these batches of thousands, 1,000 images coming off the microscope. You run a reconstruction on each one of them, use that reconstruction to estimate each image quality. And after you have 8,000 images, you can divide the image, you can sort them based on their estimated quality. And I divided the images into eight octiles, groups of 1,000. The first octile, corresponds to the thousand images of lowest estimated quality. The second octile corresponds to the slightly better images and so forth, with the top octile corresponding to the very best images. And then I performed eight more reconstructions using only the images in each octile. So this is the quality of the reconstruction you get if you only use the worst images, and then here you use the slightly better images, here you use the thousand slightly better images, here you use the thousand slightly better images, and so forth. And you might notice that uh, as you you use better images, the, the quality of the reconstruction improves. That's already a good sign. You might wonder, why is it that when I use the very best images, the quality drops again? It's because all the high quality images have essentially the same viewing angle. So when you take only the top eighth of the images, the best octile of images, they you don't get full coverage of the sphere. So you don't get a very good reconstruction. But anyway, the kind of thing you might do in practice is you might now go back and use all 8,000 images. You might say, okay, well, I have these eight different batches of 1,000 images. Let me pull them all together. If you use all 8,000 images, you get a reconstruction that has this quality here, near 0.7. But now, if you use your estimate of image quality to throw away the lowest octile and only use octiles two onward, so throw away the worst images, the quality improves and you get a better reconstruction. If you remove more images, the quality does drop until eventually, if you remove too many images, you get something that's maybe not better. Than, than just using all the images. But at the very least for this data set, throwing away the very worst images does improve things. So um, let me now, uh, how much more time do I have? I have uh, three minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, where did it go? Uh, I present a slideshow. Okay. Um, Okay, so let me just uh, very, very briefly give you a, a quick overview of some of the computational strategies that I described earlier as compression or principal modes. The big picture is simply that uh, in a pipeline with a lot of components, there's plenty of opportunity to use the standard toolkit of scientific computing, which is namely linear algebra. And the two biggest tools are uh, one, the singular value decomposition, which flattens you know, low rank objects like a hammer. And two, the Fourier transform, which is maybe a little bit more sophisticated, maybe like a screwdriver or something. And if you'll forgive the analogy, there are often scenarios where you can't just use a hammer or just use a screwdriver. But if you take a step back and peer at the problem from a few different angles, maybe it becomes obvious how to combine a hammer and the screwdriver to get the job done. So here's just a, a very quick example of the kind of thing you can do. Um, Imagine you have the following images in real space, and we could imagine that they're randomly rotated. And now you might want to try and align them as best as possible to one another. And you can tell right away that there are certain characteristic spatial frequencies that show up often in each of the image, each of the images, and other spatial frequencies are maybe not present. So you can take the Fourier transform of these images, view them in Fourier space. That's what's shown here. And you can see that certain frequency moduli are very important, whereas other frequencies don't really play a role. So if you wanted to align noisy versions of these images to one another, you might only pay attention to a particular frequency modulus k, for example, a particular ring in k space. And this is just an idealized scenario, but you could imagine a more general example where maybe two or three k rings are important. And even more generally, you could imagine picking and choosing some linear combination of rings in frequency space, trying to find that linear combination that's maybe most useful for aligning the images. And that's the essential idea underlying the radial compression that I mentioned earlier. So given any collection of images and templates, you can look for 
linear combinations of frequency rings, which are most useful for alignment. And a very natural way to quantify this problem is to look for linear combinations of frequency rings, which optimize the negative log likelihood, that's what's shown here, the negative log likelihood of mistaking one noisy randomly rotated image for another. And when you describe the problem this way, optimizing the negative log likelihood corresponds to just constrained quadratic minimization. And the solution is just a sequence of principal vectors of the associated quadratic kernel. So in other words, the best linear combinations of frequency rings to choose are just the principal modes of the Hessian of the log likelihood sitting here. And that's what I term radial principal modes. So um, I don't know, uh, just to summarize these, these radial principal modes allow you to compress the images. You can do the same thing with the volumes and uh, calculate um, things like alignment with uh, saving about an order of magnitude, maybe a factor of say five. And you can use a similar strategy to uh, compress uh, the translation operator, uh, which maybe I I won't uh, I won't go into just now, but um, but uh, but I'll leave it there. And let me just uh, thank my my collaborators, uh, Marina Spivak, still at Flatiron, Joaquin, who was at Flatiron and is now at KTH, uh, Alex and Leslie are still at Flatiron, and currently what I'm working on is I'm trying to port and uh, update the code, which is currently in MATLAB and C, which is why it's not particularly fast, into Python with Jack support as assisted by the expert Wai Sheng Tian at Flatiron. And I also believe going forward that tools of this kind could be useful in other contexts like particle picking, um, trying to collaborate with uh, some people at UMass, and also molecular dynamics. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to join forces with uh, Pilar Casio's team and uh, Wai Sheng at Flatiron. So thank you very much for, for your time. And uh, yeah, let me, uh, let me see if you guys have any questions.